Good Good morning. Man, it's so good to see all of you here on this beautiful fall day. Isn't it awesome outside? It is. I am so thankful for this great weather. And uh, don't let Pastor Kevin fool you. He didn't take a little fall. He took a big fall. And I was there to witness all of it. And my goodness, he when he landed at the bottom of those stairs, I don't think that he even knew what year it was for a while. And we prayed for him. And then he ended up having to go home and... and um, uh, we certainly missed him this weekend. We had a great staff retreat, spent a couple of days in Branson, hanging out at Silver Dollar City, Dogwood Canyon, some of those places that many of you have frequented so many times. But man, it's good to see you this morning. And, and uh, I know that, that um, we have already, you know, we've already experienced the Lord in this place through worship, through prayer, you know, just through connecting with one another. And now we're going to experience more of what God has for us through his word. And, and uh, I'm so thankful for God's word, aren't you? Man, it changes my life. And, and the more I read it and the more that I begin to understand how much God loves me and how big his plan is for me and how that he wants the very best and not just for me, but for you also. And so that is such an awesome thing. We're gonna go ahead and jump right in this morning. Um, we're in a series right now called Secrets to Victory, and I think this is our 13th week. Has anyone been here or maybe listened online for all 13 weeks? I know that many of you have. If you haven't, I would encourage you to go back and to the website and check out some of those teachings. I do want to remind you just briefly of where we have been, and then we're going to get into a bunch of new information this morning. The first secret to victory is uh, when it's over, get up. Number two, be faithful to obey all the teaching of Scripture. Number three, battles are won when God's people unite. Number four, when you get off track, change course. Number five, have an ark first mentality. Number six, set up river rocks. Number seven, cut away the flesh. Number eight, don't rebuild Jericho. Number nine, live as a steward, not an owner. Number 10, recognize the disguised. Number 11, you and God are always the majority. And then last time, the 12th secret to victory was trust God when the giants don't die. And man, you know, we have just been going all through the book of Joshua week by week, slowly just dissecting the word of God and and figuring out exactly what it is that God is saying to us. And I hope that through this series, your relationship with the Lord has become much richer and deeper. But I also hope that you have figured out that there are certain things that God um, has placed inside of you to do so that your life can be aligned for the very best that God has. Really, that's, man, that's what this series is all about. Now, the message this morning Um, to be honest, kind of took a turn. And I actually went back a couple of weeks ago and rewrote part of this teaching, which is something that I, that I rarely ever do. And honestly, I've never taught anything even remotely close to what I'm going to teach you this morning. And so for me, this truly is brand new revelation. And I want to ask just a couple of questions before we get in. And I don't want you to lift your hand. I just want you to think about this because there's some of you here today that you are fighting. You're fighting to come out of something. And it, it could be something that's connected to your past. It could be something that's going on in your life right now. But you're fighting so hard to come out of something. And then there are others of you here this morning that you are fighting for something. You are fighting with every ounce of energy that you have. You're fighting for something. And it seems like the harder you fight, the harder it gets. And I just want to say this. If you're here this morning and you're fighting for something, or if you're here this morning and you're fighting uh, to get out of something, then today I I really feel like is going to be a game changer for you. Um, And so I would encourage you to take good notes. If you don't take notes, maybe go back this week and listen to this teaching a couple of times over and over. I'm going to stick fairly close to my notes this morning because the information is a little bit complex. But I do know that uh, this is going to help you. Now, I want to start in Joshua chapter 12. And if you don't have your Bible or maybe you don't have a passion translation, I would just encourage you to read those scriptures 
off of the screen as we go through this. But over the last few weeks, we have uh, been in the book of Joshua, and there has been a reoccurring theme every week. And I want to elaborate on that theme a little bit this morning. And if you haven't been here, let me explain. When Joshua and the armies of Israel went into a new part of Canaan to occupy the land, the people already living there knew who they were before they even got there. And they usually said something like this. As the armies of God were rolling in, the enemy was usually saying something like this. Oh boy, we have heard of you guys. We have heard of you guys, news of how that your God helps you and how that you have this winning record is something that we are very, very familiar with. They would say things like, we know about all these kingdoms that you have conquered in the past. We know what you have done to all the people that were living in those kingdoms. Basically, they were saying when the armies of God rolled in, they were saying to them, you guys have a reputation of devastation, okay? For you that have been here, you know what I'm talking about. They would roll into Jericho. They would roll into A. They would roll into one of these cities. And the people living there would just become so terrified because of the past victory that the people of God had won. And so as a result... Before the battle even started, the enemy was very intimidated. You guys following me? The enemy was very intimidated. Before the battle even happened, they were already kind of shaking in their boots and, 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 and wondering what in the world was about to go on now that the people of God were here. And, and I was thinking a little bit about that. You know, the same thing happens in sports. Anybody going to watch some football today? Oh, come on, be honest. All right, I see some hands out there. The same thing happens in sports. If you know that a team has a history of pulverizing the opposition, that gets in your head. Go Cowboys. I don't know about that, Joey. (laughs) But I do know that if your team has a history of pulverizing the opposition, that gets in your head. That's why I believe personally that a good coach never takes their foot off the gas. If you can win by 100 points, you should. Not to humiliate the other team, but to send a clear message to the next team. Okay? Not to humiliate, but to send a clear message to the next team. Now, please don't email me any articles on sportsmanship. I'm not going to read them. (laughs) Listen, that's just my opinion. You follow? So if I can beat you by 100 points, I will, not to humiliate you, but so that the next team that I'm about to play knows it's going to be a real dogfight when I get there. Okay? And that's what was happening. They would go, the, the people of God, they would go into these cities and they would just annihilate everything down to the ground. And so that the next place of opposition, they had already heard about it. They had already had news of what was going on in the days, even before, you know, social media or text messaging or any of those things. They, word would spread about the people of God and how powerful they were before they even got to the place of battle. Now, back to the story. So when this happened, and when I say this, I'm talking about, about the retelling of previous battles. When, when this happened, normally they referenced two enemy kings that were previously conquered. And so these kings were obviously impressive because their names kept coming up over and over and over and over again. And if you've been here, you've heard these names, but I'm going to go ahead and give them to you again this morning. The first king was a guy named Og, and he was the king of Bashan. And then there was another king, and he was the king, uh, his name was Sihon. So he was King Sihon. So there was King Og, and there was King Sihon. And let's go ahead and read about these guys just for context. Joshua chapter 12 and verse 4, it says, Og, the king of Bashan, was one of the last of the race of giants. We're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. He reigned in the cities of Ashtaroth and And Edrei, he ruled over all Bashan, the northern half of of Gilead, 
to the boundary of Sihon, king of Heshbon. Okay, so there's some other things there about territories, but basically these two kings were King Og and King Sihon. And, Sihon. and um, I think I figured out um, what Og stands for. I think it stands for original gangster. <laughs> this was a bad dude. Now just stay with me. That's why they were always referencing this guy. When the army of God would show up, they would say, oh my Lord, we heard what you did to Og. We heard what you did to King Sihon. We, we've got word of that. Now, let me give you a little bit of history here. Kind of interesting to me, according to Deuteronomy chapter 3, Og was so tall that a special bed had to be made for him. Now, a standard king size bed is six foot eight by six foot four. According to Deuteronomy chapter three, the bed they made for Og was 13 feet long and six feet wide. So James, stand up just for a second. How, how tall are you? Six, eight. Okay, six eight times two is 13 foot four inches, okay? So think about this. Og could have been twice as tall as James, okay? All right, you can be seated. Thank you, sir. His bed was 13 feet, 13 and a half feet long. So realistically, he could have been. That's why some people think, you know, Goliath could have been over 13 feet tall. He was from the same line. But you know what? Anything over 10 feet, does it really matter anymore? I don't think so, right? But I want you to get the picture. I want you to picture this guy, Og. Could have been at least twice as tall as James. He could not sleep in a regular bed. This, this guy, this guy was, was, was serious. Now, um, why am I telling you all this? Well, Joshua chapter 12 and verse 6, this is going to be a really important verse. It says Moses, wow, there's Moses now. We're talking about Moses, not Joshua. And I'm going to show you why in a second. It says Moses and the Israelites conquered the two kings, Sihon and Og. And so here in this verse, it's not Joshua, it's Moses who is conquering these, these enemy kings. It wasn't Joshua leading those battles, it was Moses proving it was more about worship than it was about leadership. Now, just hang with me there for a second. Moses was awesome Joshua was awesome, but both of them always took the people to a place of worship before they entered into a place of warfare. Now, the 15th secret to victory in two weeks, we're going to get to that, but the 15th secret is worship before warfare, okay? And we kind of see a little bit of it happening here. Now, here's the important part that I want you to get this morning. These two iconic battles with these two impressive kings took place while the people of God were still in the wilderness, okay? So Og and Sihon, they didn't live in Canaan. They lived in the wilderness. You guys follow that? And they were conquered not under the leadership of Joshua, but under the leadership of Moses. And so these battles all happened pre-Jericho. So we started the series in Jericho. And in part one, we were, we were in Jericho, and we, we saw the people of God go in and take the city down to its foundations. But all of that started back in the wilderness under the leadership of a guy named Moses. And now here we are in Joshua. And we see the people talking about these previous battles that had just been fought. So, Ihon, or, so Og and Sihon, guys get this, these guys were wilderness kings. And that's going to make a lot of sense in a minute. These guys were wilderness kings, not promised land kings. These guys were wilderness kings. We find out in Joshua chapter 12 and verse 9 that Joshua actually conquered 31 kings, but, but they weren't wilderness kings. They were all kings of Canaan. Let's read it. Joshua 12 and verse 9 says, here is a list of the 31 kings destroyed by Joshua. And if you go in there and you look at all of those kingdoms, all of those kingdoms were conquered after they crossed the Jordan River and entered into the promised land. So Moses was conquering wilderness kings and Joshua was conquering promised land kings. And that, that is going to be 
important information for you to remember as we move through. But here's the lesson. You'll never have a chance to engage the kings of Canaan if you don't learn to fight your way through the wilderness seasons of life. You guys with me? What does Pastor Kevin always say on Wednesday night? Are you, uh, what does he say? Are you, are you smelling when I'm stepping in? I don't know. It's just weird what he says. I, I, like most everything he says is weird, but that's, that's one that he says. So you don't, like, you don't get an opportunity to engage the kings of Canaan if you don't learn to fight your way through the wilderness seasons of life. And, and Joshua positioned himself to face and defeat the kings of Canaan because he first fought his way through the kings of the wilderness. He was with Moses in those wilderness battles. Now, Moses was the leader at that time, but Joshua was his protege. And so they were there together fighting Og, fighting Sihon. He was a part of that, of that whole story during that, that time, and, and, and he, he was with him. Now, that's a difficult thing because, guys, I want you to hear me. Um, we, we, we have to get this. It's so important. Joshua had positioned himself to defeat the kings of Canaan because he fought his way through the kings of the wilderness. And that's a difficult thing because wilderness kings are more powerful than promised land kings. Let me, let me explain. Wilderness kings are og, 13 and a half feet tall, fierce fighters, fierce fighters. And then you get over into the book of Joshua and we start reading about the kings of Canaan and the kings of Canaan are hiding in a cave because they're afraid of Joshua. They're not fierce fighters. What we call them? They're pansy kings, right? You know, Og, a giant, 13 and a half feet tall, fierce. Everybody knew when these people defeated Og, this is a serious, serious situation that we're not going to escape because these people are, these people are just ruthless and powerful. And then you, you flip, they cross into the Jordan River, they start going into different cities and taking different cities, and these kings are hiding in caves. So, they're, so, so wilderness kings and promised land kings are very different. And here's the revelation that I had, okay, and why I went back and rewrote part of this teaching. Wilderness kings and promised land kings are not the same. And I'll give you some examples Wilderness kings are something that you're fighting to come out of. So a wilderness king would be something like addiction, divorce, bitterness, the pain of life. How many of you know these are all ferocious fighters? Right? Anybody ever been through any of that stuff? Right? Ever have something go really wrong in your life and it causes you to have bitterness in your heart? Or have you ever had someone that you trusted just knife you in the back? And so you're having trouble with that. You can't get through it. These things are all, these are all powerful, powerful fighters. Wilderness kings are powerful, powerful fighters. Now get this. Promised land kings or kings of Canaan have more to do with inheritance and blessing. So they go into Canaan, and what are they doing? They're taking the cities, they're taking the plunder, they're taking the livestock, they're taking the wealth, they're taking all these things. And, and they're, they're not nearly as powerful as wilderness kings. And so here's the thing. We look at people who are battling wilderness kings, and we wonder what is wrong with them, and why, why, they, why are they not winning? Why are they always relapsing? Why are they always stuck in grief after years? Why are they ate up with bitterness over how life went? And let me just say this. Here's what's wrong with them. They are most likely battling with something that is bigger than what you're battling because just like Joshua, not all kings and not all battles are the same. And, and fighting to go into blessing and abundance, promised land kings, 
is different than fighting to come out of addiction and the pain of life, wilderness kings. Are you guys with me? Okay, listen, this is revelation to me. This will change how you approach every spiritual battle that you fight. Wilderness kings and promised land kings are not the same. Do you have some people in your life who, who are fighting a wilderness king? And you, don't, you, just, like, you don't get them. You're like, well, why don't they just stop taking drugs? Oh, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be nice if it were that easy? Right? Why can't they just not be gay anymore? Come on, stay with me. Like, you, you have people in your life that are fighting wilderness kings? Listen, I hope that you leave here with a different perspective of those people and that you stop being so judgmental. Man, that was kind of harsh. I'm sorry about that, guys. I'll say it this way. I hope that I leave here with a different perspective and that I learn to stop being so judgmental. Right? Do you have people in your life? Do you have people in your life who are battling wilderness kings? Let me ask you this. Are you, are you fighting a wilderness king? Are you fighting to come out of something? And it just seems so powerful, so big, 13 foot, four inches tall, big, so big that a special bed has to be made for it. I mean, come on. Are, are you fighting that? Now, here, here's where we are. In Joshua chapter 12 and verse 6, it says, it says, Moses and the Israelites conquered two kings, Sihon and Og. Okay, remember, those guys, wilderness kings. Then they cross the Jordan, and we get into Joshua chapter 12 and verse 9, and it says, here is the list of 31 kings destroyed by Joshua, and these guys are all promised land kings. I want you to look how lopsided that is. The destruction of two wilderness kings, guys, caused 31 promises of God to come to pass. That's lopsided. The destruction of two wilderness kings called, caused 31 promises of God to come about, to pass. 31 kings, 31 cities, 31 points of conquest and blessing. But it all started with the destruction of two wilderness kings. So they're fighting to come out. They're fighting to come out. And once they get out, now they're fighting for what they want. The blessing, the, the abundance, the, the, the bigness of life. And um, that brings me to my first point this morning. The 15th secret to victory is this. You ready? Here we go. Kill the king in front of you. Just kill the king in front of you. It doesn't matter if you're fighting to come in, it doesn't matter if you're fighting to get out, just kill him. Just kill him. Now you're like, okay, that's a great plan, Larry. How do we do that? I'm so glad you asked. You guys ask me the best questions. Kill the king in front of you. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about a physical king. I'm not even talking about a spiritual king. I'm talking about being very strategic in how you approach what is, what's in front of you. You know, you, you have to approach every opponent differently. And that's why even in sports, they spend all week, you know, in the, in the film room watching, uh, watching the other team. You know, like in football especially, they're, 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 they spend weeks watching um, film of their opposition. Because whenever you go into that game on Sunday or whenever it is or on Friday night, you want to know, you, you don't, want to just know that you've practiced and that you're prepared to score points. You want to know the other team and what their strategies are going to be, okay? And so as you go into this battle, you need to have um, a strategy. You need to know what to do with whatever opposition is in front of you, whether it's a wilderness king or whether it's a promised land king. You need to know how to approach those as you, as you move in. So, so here's the thing. If it's a wilderness king, as I said before, I just want to reiterate, you're going to be fighting to come out. If it's a king of Canaan, you're going to be fighting uh, to go in, okay? 
So it's kind of like offense and defense in football. Now, I want to give you a little bit of history. In the book of Exodus, I want you to see this. In the book of Exodus, they're fighting to come out. Okay? They're fighting to come out of slavery, out of wandering, out of spiritual apathy. And as they're fighting to come out, they go through Og, they go through Sihon. In the book of Joshua, they're fighting to go in. They're fighting to go into blessing. They're fighting to go into abundance. They're fighting to go into God's best. And there will be times in your life when you're going to be fighting to come out. And there are going to be times in your life when you're fighting to go in. And here's what I think is interesting. Since we're talking about kings, let's, let's look at a little bit of history. It's not until you get into 1 Samuel that we see the people of God having a king. Okay, um, they were they were led by priests in the beginning, like like Moses and Samuel, and then after that they were led by judges like Samson and Deborah, and then they were eventually led by kings like Saul and David. They were only given a king because they demanded one. And if you go back into First Samuel, you'll see how Samuel was trying to explain to them that 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 God should be their king. And that they needed no other king but God. But they were not hearing Samuel at the time. And so as a result, something catastrophic happened. Instead of the king of kings fighting for them, regular men started fighting for them. Men like Saul, David, Solomon, Rehoboam, Jeroboam, Abijah, Asa, Ahab, and the list goes on and on and on of the kings of Israel. Some of those kings were good, but many of them were bad. And so, and so God raised up prophets like Elijah and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel to bring the people back to him so that they would recognize him as their true king. Okay, you with me? And then after the prophets, there, were, there was 400 years of silence. That's called the Dark Ages. And then after the Dark Ages, Jesus came, right? And so, and so all through that season, God was saying to the people, hey, I just want to be your king. I just want to be your king. And all through that season, the people were rejecting God as king. And they were accepting other things and putting other things on the throne of their life. And then that's when they got way off track. Now, um, let's get into the take-home part today. Like, this is the part that you can leave here and put to work in your life. So why do you need to know what kind of king you're facing? Why do you need to know? Well, because as I've said, it will, it will change your approach. So let's talk about wilderness kings for a minute, and then we're going to talk about promised land kings. If you're battling a wilderness king, and you need to come out of something that has got you lost, has got you wandering, has got you trapped, has got you stuck or sidelined, you are going to need scriptures like Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. So let's go ahead and go there and read that. It says, As for us, we all have these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. So we must, look at this, so we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin we so easily fall into. Then we will be able to run life's marathon race with passion and determination, for the path has already been marked out before us. I love that, that verse. He, he gives us some things to do if you're, if you're facing a wilderness king. The first thing that he says, he says, let go of every wound that has pierced us. Let go of every wound that has pierced us. This is interesting. In the original Greek, it says it differently. In the original Greek, it implies that you're having trouble coming out of something because there's an arrow tip broken off inside a wound that is weighing you down. What that means is you were struck by something that you are still carrying. Have you ever been struck by something that you're still carrying? I have many times. Many times in life, many times in ministry, you, you know, people think, you know, pastors have this, you know, all this armor and all this perfect life and, you know, that you don't really ever get hit hard. But let me tell you, that's not true. And so he's talking here about, you know, about something struck you and then it broke off inside you and you're still carrying that around with you. Listen, guys, that situation 
will 100% keep you trapped in the wilderness. If you get struck by something that, you, that gets broke off inside you and you don't deal with that, that will 100% keep you in the wilderness. 100% keep you trapped and stuck and miserable. That, listen, that king, how many of you know, is not easily defeated? You ever been struck, how many, let's be honest, you ever been struck by something that broke off inside you? And then you carried it, right? You carried it. Those of you who archery hunt know what I'm talking about. You know, like when you shoot an arrow into an animal, a lot of times that arrow will break off. And then when you field dress that animal, you'll find that arrow inside that animal. So it ran, it ran for days sometimes. Sometimes it can run for days until it, slows, it slowly kills them, especially if they're shot in the gut, right? That's a little graphic, but it happens, right? They get shot. It breaks off inside them. They carry it for as long as they can, and then they die. And let me tell you, that's what the enemy wants for you. That's what the enemy wants for you. You know those fiery darts that the Bible talks about that the enemy is shooting at us? He's hoping that one of those hits you and breaks off inside you so that you carry it that you can't let it go, that you carry it with you as, as you go. And um, you were struck by something that, that broke off and then you're, that you're carrying. And the next thing that he says to do, if you're, if you're facing a wilderness king, he says, he makes this statement, he says, and the sin that we so easily fall into. In the Greek, it says um, that this sin uh, will easily entangle you and that it is a sin that is always ready and always waiting for you. And you can read a little bit about that in the book of Genesis with Cain and Abel, but we don't, we don't have time to do that this morning. And again, this is the kind of thing that will keep you in the wilderness. I, I talk to people all the time who say, Larry, you know, I want, I want the abundance. I want the blessing. I, I want the overflowing cup that Jesus offers. But I just have this thing in my life that, that keeps knocking me down every time I get on my feet. And you know what they're saying? They're saying, I want Canaan, but I'm always stuck in the wilderness. Like, I want to get to the kings of Canaan, but I can't get past the kings of the wilderness. And so when you're trying to come out of something, your approach is different than when you're fighting for something. So here's, here's boil, boiling it all down. When you're, when you're coming out, according to this verse, when you're fighting to come out of something, you have to do a lot of letting go. Okay, put Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 back up there. It says, it says so we must let go of every wound that has pierced us. Okay, it's like, well, I'm not letting it go. Okay, that's your choice. But you, you're going to stay trapped in that for a long time. Right? It's like, I'm not letting it go. I, I'm, I'm not surrendering. I'm not letting it go. I'm going to hang on. Okay, well, you know what? You're probably going to die with it. And you know what else you're going to do? You're going to blame the rest of us for it right? It's like, I'm not letting it go. Okay, fine. Be miserable, but leave me out of it. Okay? You have to, you have to let it, he says, let, he says, if you've been hit by something, if you've been wounded and it broke off inside you, he said, there comes a time when you have to just let it go. Right? And then he goes on and he says, um, and the sin that we so easily fall into. So if you're trying to come out of something, you have to do a lot of letting go. He says you have to let go of the wound and you have to let go of the sin. Sometimes you have to let go of some people. Sometimes you have to let go of some things. Sometimes you have to let go of some places. Sometimes you have to let go of like your stubbornness and your w unwillingness to let it go. Sometimes you have to let go the need to be right. How many of you know being right can be lonely? You can be right and sleep on the couch. I know. Okay, listen. <laughs> you, guys follow, you guys tracking with me? Okay, listen. If you're, try, if you're trying to come out of something, you have to get to the place where you're willing to do a lot of letting go. And the people who won't, they never come out. 
They never come out. They, they never get past Og. They never get past Sihon. They never get past those big wilderness seasons and those big wilderness battles of life because they're just so dead set on hanging on to it. And so he said, hey, you got to let go. You got to let go. Okay, we got we to gotta let go of that point and move on or we're never going to be done. So the next thing is this. I told Linda B. this morning, I'm like, if I don't get rid of some of these notes, we're going to be here till dark. So um, anytime you guys are ready for me to quit, just throw something at me and I'll stop. Number next, here we go. If you're fighting, if, so if you're fighting to come out of something, you got to let go. The next thing is, if you're fighting for something, you need verses like Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. Okay? So we, it, it depends on what, Again, we're studying the opposition. We're studying our opponent. And so if you're fighting for something, you've got to have verses like Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. I think the IV says, the IV says, don't grow weary in well-doing because in due season you will reap. But the Passion Translation really nails it and, and gets it the closest to the Greek. The Passion Translation says, and don't allow yourselves to be weary or disheartened in planting good seeds. For the season of reaping the wonderful harvest you've planted is coming. Man, guys, there's so much in there. We don't have time to talk about it for very long. But basically what he's saying is it, it tells us what to do when you're fighting for something. If you're fighting for something, what does it tell us to do? If you're fighting for something, you better be planting. Isn't that what it said? If you're fighting for something, you better be planting. And I got this image in my head of this person out there on the battlefield, like swinging a sword, and at the same time, wearing a bag around their shoulder full of seeds. So they're out there, they're fighting for something, and the whole time, they're, they're, putting, a, they're putting a seed in the ground, right? They're, you're, you're fighting to get somewhere, you're fighting to... To get to the next place, to, you're, you're fighting one of those kings of Canaan to get to the place of abundance, to get to the place of blessing, to get to the place of God's best. And the whole time you're fighting, you're supposed to be, you're supposed to be planting. As they're fighting, they're planting. If you're fighting one of those weak, pansy kings of Canaan, you can do that, right? You can be like, and then put a seed in the ground. Because you know that that is not a very formidable opponent, Right? But if you're fighting a wilderness king, planting is the last thing on your mind because you're just trying to survive to the next day. Right? So you see the difference? So he's like, if you're fighting a wilderness king, all you're trying to do is let go of it and give it to God, right? But if you're fighting to go into abundance and blessing and prosperity and God's best, he says, you're going to be fighting, but you also need to going to be, be planting. And you can do that because this enemy is not nearly as powerful, right? So you're fighting, but you're also planting. See, guys, God is a farmer. He established seed time and harvest. And if you're fighting uh, for um, abundance and blessing and prosperity and God's best, you better be planting or sowing those things because if you sow them, you will grow them. Right? See, if we sow them, we can grow them. But if we don't, then we can't. You can't have God's best if you're planting your worst everywhere you go. Right? You can't. You, you got to be sowing what you, want, what you want in your life, what you need in your life, what you're believing God for in your life. You have to be sowing as you're fighting. Wilderness kings and kings of Canaan are very different. But as we study them, and we're going to pick up here next week so that we can finish this up, but, but I think you guys get the, the point. So let's go ahead and stand this morning. I'm going to ask the band to come back. And I just want you guys to pray with me for a second before we move, before we move on. Lord, I thank you today that, that you are a God of answers. 
Not a God who is far off. Not a God who has distance himself from us, but a God who says, I am close at hand. Lord, that you're fighting um, alongside us. We've read it in Joshua so many times where it talks about how the Lord fought alongside them. And so we're not here, Lord, to say, um, Lord, all the responsibility is on you, but we're also not here to say all the responsibility is on us. We're here to say, God, that you're, you are our partner in uh, not just the, the, the battles of life, but in the blessings of life too. Lord, you, um, you, you are in control of all of it. And so today, God, as we, as we move into this altar time, we just pray, Lord, that the information that went out, um, that it would be, um, Lord, that it would be medicine for those who are hurting, that it would be an answer for someone who's questioning, that it would be light for someone who feels like they're stuck in a dark place. Lord, that we could see breakthrough in our lives. We need it. We need you. And so today, God, we just ask that you, God, that you do that deep work in our hearts that needs to be done. We know that you're here. We know that your presence is here. We know that it, it's always here, whether we feel it or not. We know, Lord, that you're with us always. And so today, God, just speak truth and life to people. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask the prayer team to go ahead and come this morning. And we're going to do two things, um, actually three things. First of all, if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if you've never invited Jesus to come into your life, you've never asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins, maybe you've never truly been a Christian, um, we want you to know that Jesus loves you and Jesus died for you. And that if you had been the only one, Jesus would have died just for you. I want you to know that no matter what your past has been, um, there is no uh, way that you could ever out sin the forgiveness of Jesus. And so you may not feel like you're worthy of his forgiveness, but I want you to know that, that um, if you could have fixed that on your own, Jesus would have never died for you. And so it doesn't matter what your past is like. Listen, he doesn't care and we don't care. And we want you to come to know Jesus as your Savior. So if you don't know Jesus, then um, any one of these folks that are standing here in front can help you with that as we get ready to pray. And there are two groups I want to pray for this morning. I don't know exactly how this is going to go, so we're just going to kind of jump in. But if you're here today and you would say, hey, Larry, I feel like that I am facing a wilderness king. I feel like... Uh, I'm fighting to come out of something. Maybe when I talked about you got hit by something that broke off inside you, like it's still in you. You carried it in here today. It's still inside you. You're fighting a wilderness king. Um, if you're here this morning and that's you, in just a minute, I'm gonna ask you to come to my right, your left. If you're here this morning and you feel like you're fighting for something, like you've, you've won some hard fought battles, you've You've come out of some wilderness seasons and now you're fighting for God's best. You're fighting for abundance and blessing and, and, and just the, the overflowing cup that Jesus was talking about, but you feel a little bit stuck in your fight. Um, and this teaching spoke to you today. You're fighting, you're fighting a king of Canaan. You're fighting to go in and you just can't seem to get there, but you're fighting to go in. If that's you, I want you to come to my left, your right, okay? So we're gonna pray for you today. So wilderness king battles over here, Kings of, king of Canaan battles over here. Guys, go ahead and just start making your way. There's gonna be a bunch of you, so just go ahead and somebody be first. All right, I see some people who are coming, so come on up. Over here, you're wounded, something broke off inside you. Um, you're trying to come out of something hard. Um, over here, you're fighting for God's best. You're fighting for abundance. You're fighting for prosperity. You're fighting just to get into that next good season and happy season of life. Come on up, guys. We're going to pray over you here in just a minute. Let's believe God to do some really, really good things in your life. But I want you to know that where, whatever battle you're fighting, I want you to know Jesus sees you. He sees you in that fight. He loves you so much. He wants to meet you there. He wants to join you there. He wants to help you there with all of it, okay? And um, he will. 
he can do that. He's that powerful. He's that good. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ask the prayer team and staff that's here just to to, to begin praying uh, for those that are, that are on both sides. And I'm going to come down and walk through and pray a little bit too. And and as we do that, the band is going to lead us in some more worship. And so if you're not here, um, I just encourage you to either worship or just talk to God or maybe just stand in his presence and listen. It's all the same, right? And um, we're going to just spend some time together today before we go. So guys that are praying, go ahead. Just begin to get in there, pray a little bit over some folks. And I'll come down and we're going to pray. If you have a friend up here that you'd like to pray with, then obviously we would invite you to come up and, and pray with them as well, okay? If not, let's just let's just worship.